So yeah, we'll both, I'm, I'm Tom Belstorff and I'm Braxton Soderman. Hey, so we'll each talk briefly about some of our own stuff and then and very briefly talk about a joint project we're doing and I'm, I'm so glad that, um, that Magda and Walt and organized this and I really hope to stay in touch with all of you because I'm a bit of a panicky moment in my life where I'm starting three new research projects but you know I have tenure so it's okay but it's an exciting time to be doing this stuff. I'm a professor in the Department of Anthropology here at Irvine. I was editor-in-chief of American Anthropologist um, until very recently, so I'm very well grounded in anthropology, even though my bachelor's is in, in music, um, so I also have this music background as well. But I'm going to talk, we're going to talk about a shared project right now, but let me briefly mention two other projects I'm doing that are light, less game focused, but just beginning. This summer I'm going to be going back to Indonesia to begin a new project looking at queer social media in Indonesia. I've been going to Indonesia since 1992, I speak the language fluently, my first two books, The Gay Archipelago and A Coincidence of Desires, are both about gay, lesbian, lesbian, transgender subjectivity in Indonesia. I'm going to be working with communities that I've been working with for over 20 years there to think about what's going on with social media and queerness in what is actually the fourth largest country in the world by population after China, India, and the US, and home to more Muslims than any other nation in the world by far. More Muslims there than the whole Arab world, um, but it does not get much attention thinking about the internet in general. The second project that I'm going to be doing uh, beginning in July is I have a national, new National Science Foundation grant from Anthropology and um, STS that I'm doing with a colleague at University of Oregon on new cultures of disability. Um, I'm going to be doing work in Second Life and high fidelity and actually getting devices for people um, with disabilities to think about what happens with thinking about <coughs> virtual worlds and disability if we don't take the able body as the default body that people are, are going in there. And I've been working with some groups of folks with Parkinson's and some other disabilities in Second Life and other virtual worlds for many years. My third and fourth books, Coming of Age in Second Life and the Handbook of Ethnographic Methods that I co-wrote with Bonnie Nardi, T.L. Taylor, and Celia Pierce are both in that, that Second Life space. And it's funny how people ask me, why are you still doing stuff in Second Life? And they never ask me, why are you still doing stuff in Indonesia, as I mentioned to someone else. And there's, there's such an issue around history and, and paying attention to things over time in the digital space that I'm really excited. I'm not only going to be doing work on high fidelity, but also in, in, uh, in uh, the Second Life space. So I would love to talk to people about those uh, projects. So while I set this, oh, this is set up. Uh, do you want to talk? Presentation. Oh, you did already. So, <laughs> did, well, literally. do you want to talk about some of your own, the other book you're Just working on briefly, first? Okay, very, very yeah. Very, um, yeah, I'm in the Film and Media Studies Department at UCI, and I'm like, oop, oh, oh sorry. Uh, and uh, do more like critical uh, theory <clears throat> about video games. And uh, I don't have tenure right now, and I'm starting this other project on. But we're going to do so it. Yes. Know, that's a good thing. But, yes, <laughs> <laughs> um, but my other book, book project is actually a critical study of uh, Csikszentmihalyi's notion of flow, and it's called The Flowing Subject, and it comes from a more critical humanities perspective. In games, everybody knows kind of what this concept is, and a lot of the research is about uh, exploring it, developing it, uh, learning more about the theory, developing quantitative methods for study and enjoyment and other things, but I'm more coming at the perspective of looking at flow from different angles as creating dominant forms of subjectivity which with do critique uh, as a mode of commodification, extending game time and play time and duration of play, which is like commodified. Uh, gender relationships, the chick sent me high talks about macro and micro flow, and so it's about deconstructing the, or, or, or talking about who's allowed to flow, you know, like, uh, and who's not allowed to flow. And then the last part is about gamification, because his early work in 1975, uh, he talked about the politics of um, enjoyment, right? And it was really a really early version of gamification. And I'm very positive about this, actually. A lot of people critique Jay McGonagall and gamification in the humanities from a critical theory kind of perspective. But I'm actually more positive about it because flow is not just about video games. It's about basketball. It's about conversation. It's about enjoyment. There's something positive about that. And I do, I do want to be able to understand that. But I think the video games are actually now capturing that enjoyment and that, that kind of power of the video game um, in, in a way that's commodified and I want to kind of release that, the positivity <coughs> for something else. Okay. So this is now, so this is our like guilt fun awesome project that we're doing that, it's not guilt, which actually I think it's very politically important, that's not about flow and not about queer Indonesia and not about disability and not about virtual worlds. But it is building on interest that Braxton obviously has, interest that I have, my real interest in taking history more seriously in this space. I'm really shocked coming out of the queer space where I was telling someone before like everyone reads Foucault and thinks about history all the time. Um, the degree to which the historicity of the things that we're thinking about
around is often not talked about. So our, our project, and this is brand spanking new, so we're just making this up as we go along right now, but it's gonna be totally fun. We are right now calling Intelligent Visions platform cultures and the Intellivision system. And this is an attempt to rethink what's known as platform studies in a generous way, but doing something quite different than what's been done with that before. And to do that, we're focusing on the Intellivision <coughs> system, which was an early video game system from the late 70s and early 80s that I played as a junior high school to early high school uh, person, and Braxton played um, a few years younger than that, which dates us, but not too much of an age, age gap there, but it was something we both grew up with. Um, that has really not been talked about, even though at the time it was a hugely important video game system, and actually its competition with Atari sort of founded the whole like PC versus Apple, Google versus Yahoo kind of, uh, of thing. So we are using sort of four perspectives to think about this. The first is in television is social history. And so this was the first age of home console video games. Um, and so we want to think about that. The Intellivision <coughs> system actually, well, you'll see in a little bit, had little images. It was the first video game system to have sort of human figures in it. Braxton, when I get to the computational slide, he can explain more of this stuff. It was built around this figure of intelligence. So here you see George Plimpton talking about this intelligent system that was comparing it with Atari. Um, and so this idea of platform warfare was a very important part of it. Um, we also have been looking at video game magazines, but also the imagery of that time. Here's a wonderful example from a, something called Vidiot. Um, arcade Macho, Pick Up or Shut Up. Hey. And bu building on sort of Jaron Lanier's notion of lock-in in a way, and this issue, issue of historicity and having recently had Brianna Wu here, we're very motivated to think about what happened in this very early stage of the, the gaming space that locked in assumptions around gender and race and sexuality <clears throat> and mastery and all kinds of things. And not in a sort of deterministic sense, but in a sense that has influence. The historicity of the present is a, is a real and important thing. Um, so the second framework we're thinking about, maybe you can tell us about computational infrastructure. Well, this actually comes from more a traditional platform studies approach to this you know, book series run by Ian Bogos and Nick Mumford at um, MIT, you know, where they're interested in looking at the technical <coughs> structure of, of uh, particular platform systems in a really precise way through code and hardware, et cetera. We're not, we're interested in the kind of things that we might find in that. And we want to take it seriously. And we want to take not it seriously. Not in a level sense. But yeah. we're also, you know, also, critical of some of the kind of techno fetishism that happens there at that level. Um, but there's a lot of interesting things that come out. I'm not going to talk about all these things. Um, you know, one thing that I've been researching lately is this kind of running man kind of idea. Uh, and that was kind of, yeah, we think that, huh? Oh, there's an image of the running man oh, on that logo oh, you can right see here. right there. It's like the famous of, yeah, kind, of hard to see. kind of logo or brand or whatnot. Um, and there's a lot of interesting mythology behind this uh, character that they were actually programmed into uh, the GROM or the graphics ROM that was located on the chip of the Intellivision. So, um, but that's not true. So there's actually this you know, kind of fantasy that people say, well, this running man was actually part of this thing that was conceived at the beginning of the Intellivision. But it's also this kind of, you know, this inscription of the human, you know, this like white little running man within the space that appears in all these different games. Um, and there's a lot of like kind of interesting things to say about it uh, that we can say later. Uh, the other thing I'd just say is like the exec was maybe for the first OS to happen on a gaming system uh, where, you know, instead of uh, programming directly in assembly, uh, people were actually, or there was one program that built an OS that you could not call functions from, and so it actually helped with programming a lot, but at the same time, the executive was also very frustrating uh, to work with, and a lot of programmers built around it, so we're interested in how uh, that those kind of power structures also kind of up here within the technical hardware. And just to note, so the Intellivision was the first system in some ways where figure of the human appeared in a particular way in gaming, yeah. and also this notion of intelligence against Atari, um, which was ships, spaceships that fought, right? So there's something interesting there. And oh my god, if you've never played Intellivision, the controllers, which are clearly influenced by television, by, by telephones at the time, they're so awesome. We have a little lab with Intellivisions over in the anthropology we're playing with. It's so much fun. Um, we won't talk about other stuff of this now, just like three more slides. The third, th uh, 
uh, uh, perspective we're taking is sort of as gaming space. And an interesting issue, we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. We're critical of a lot of the platform study stuff, but we want to be generous and engage in it in some ways. And one interesting thing we're th interested in thinking about is sort of overarching features of systems that aren't reducible to the individual cartridges, right? So that things that would move, and actually you can't really see it very clearly in the red ba uh, side of Sea Battle, but Sea Battle was part of the action network. They actually grouped games into networks. And so not just figures of Running Man, but <coughs> dynamics of gameplay and other kinds of cultural assumptions were built across the platform and are not reducible to individual games, to individual cartridges. We're looking at notions how gender and race got sort of written into this and sexuality and be given the notion of intellivision, the way that intellivision, intelligence was written into this. And actually we uh, were just playing reversey on the intellivision and looking at how it was like boop, 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 thinking it was so awesome. Um, and also something that Braxton's been thinking about is taking the television set seriously as part of the platform, which is not often done in platform studies and was very key in this space. I, said, I, I put this on the slide literally 10 minutes ago because we were doing Fantastic Voyage. Microsurgeon may have been the first example of this kind of thing. It is an awesome game for Intellivision that you go into brains and do stuff. It was one of the only games ever coded for Intellivision where the two handled controllers, you actually would use them both like to pilot the thing. It's an incredible game. Um, so anyway, thinking about the historicity of these things, I just couldn't help not put that in. And then the last perspective, this is also from Vidiot, um, uh, no, thinking about uh, the image, um, about like the beginning of a home arcade um, gaming. Um, the one thing I want to mention about this is we are going to have undergrads play the Intellivision system. And as an ethnographer myself, I'm interested in what I'm calling playing the archive or staging ethnography. What does it mean to have undergraduates at Irvine use their literacy skills, digital literacy skills, and actually I'm going to videotape them, video them using these controllers and playing these games, not because what they experienced is the same as what I or Brax experienced, but in addition to doing oral histories with designers and players, we want to think about what that contemporary perspective could get us and how this helps us think about archive work in a different way when you can actually play the archive. Um, is something that has actually not been written about hardly ever and actually platform studies people don't do that typically. So that's a method that we're going to use to think about this notion of digital experience. Any other pieces of this you wanted to say something about? We're, we're at good time. We're okay, yeah, yeah. So thank you and we're excited about all these things that we're doing that we still don't know what the hell we're doing, but we look forward to working more with all you and, and building these networks. Thank you. Questions? Any questions? Sorry. I would just say quickly, like, if you, with, this is all new, so if you know research or sites yeah. of people playing the archive, you know, like, let us you know. you want to play some television? Kind of articles about gender and, <laughs> and sexuality and games and systems, like, any of that kind of stuff, let's know. So, uh, I was talking a bit to Tom about this last night, but I remembered the reference, which I couldn't recall then, uh, which is that uh, Nathan Ensminger in the Department of Computer Science at Indiana <coughs> University, Bloomington, right. has done some fantastic <coughs> work looking at the gendering of computer science. He's, he's got a book that just came out called The Computer Boys Takeover that looks at how computer engineering started as a feminine profession and the ways in which sort of rhetoric, rhetorics of masculinity uh, and rhetorics of a male workspace overtook computer science yeah. and turned it uh, into a very gendered profession. Wendy Chung um, writes on that. Yeah. 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 Shaw has some, some stuff yeah. in this space too. Shaw Thank does. You. I didn't know who wrote that book. Yeah. So but no, we're I looking look at, at the parallels and seeing whether or not these same narratives emerged in the arcade space or in the game space. Maybe another reading suggestion. I don't know if you know Zoya Street's work. So he's coming from slightly outside the academy um, and is doing platform studies specific to console generations hmm. in a way that's engaged with politics and gender and race and things like that. So I'll definitely history. get that. Yeah. <coughs> do you folks do any work in text adventure? Because this is something that I'm interested in partly because it's an easy prototyping platform, right. but also because our, some of our first female game designers were text adventure designers. Right. And so I was just wondering if, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a field where people are currently playing the archive. It's a small group well, of people, but it's the sort of IF available. Community. The IF community is The IF strong. community, yes. Right. But it's, well, it's, I think it's pretty good. Yeah, I think it's pretty exciting, actually, but it's very oh, yeah, sure. small. I, um, I write, I mean, the, for this project, we're really focusing on Intellivision. In my right. second life book, I actually write about MUDs, but also going all the way back to adventure as an important 
early sort of thing for thinking about virtual worlds, because part of what my NSF project is, is thinking about how, you know, that people often get so confused about sort of VR and VW, virtual worlds and, and virtual reality, because they don't have to, it's like a Venn diagram. And we're in a moment now where new kinds of overlappings are happening with these things, and the text stuff is really helpful for parsing, the text stuff is helpful for parsing that out. Um, so it is something that's interesting to have <coughs> looked at before with my second life work. I want the new furry mark. I don't know what it is, but I want the new furry mark. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you Thanks. very much.